All right. All right. So we're going to talk today about the, the purpose of parables. Uh, now, most people think Jesus told stories to make everything clear. Uh, he actually told stories because he didn't want them to understand. <laughs> a story without an explanation is a riddle that can't be solved. But for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, the stories illustrate his divine truth powerfully. Right? So our purpose today is to unlock the parables of Jesus. Why? Because this is a very fundamental and indispensable truth concerning our salvation and the kingdom of God. We have to understand the parables ourselves before we can help make those parables become a reality to someone else. So teaching about the parables is really important. There's actually a parable that Jesus told during the middle of his Passion Week that ignited the final fire, or should we say poured gas on the fire of those who rejected him. You see, before that time, Jesus only preached out of the Old Testament because they would recognize that. But at this particular turning point, he stopped preaching from the Old Testament and he started speaking in parables. It was a pivotal point in his ministry. He only, as you know, was in ministry for three years in public ministry on the earth. So they were looking for a way to seize him, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, because they hated him. And it's really a, a combination of the raising of Lazarus that really ticked off the religious leaders and the telling of the parable that predicted the human activity that led to his cruel execution. Uh, the, all of those things that, that Jesus taught that they didn't understand infuriated the religious leaders and the Jews of the day. I want to pause just for a second to say hello to Miss Priscilla. Where, did, where are you, Miss Priscilla? And I want to say how proud I am that you're here this morning. Thank you. Her husband, Mike, went to be with the Lord and uh, was a great man, a wonderful guy, and uh, loved Jesus with all of his heart, and he loved his wife. And we're so proud of Priscilla for being here today. We pray for you, and, and we're grateful that you're here. Amen. Now, Jesus told close to 40 parables that are simple in one sense, but also profound in another. How many of you know that a lot of times the disciples had to say, Lord, can you explain that? How many of you have ever had to ask the Lord to explain something to you? Amen. All right. So especially the one about the good Samaritan or the rich fool or the wedding feast or the dishonest manager and several others, they had to ask him. And sometimes Jesus just went ahead and gave the explanation without them even asking because he wanted them to understand. So today we're going to find uh, their divine purposes and profound insights uh, that Jesus was trying to bring the truth of salvation and his kingdom. Now watch, the difference between church people and kingdom people is kingdom people understand the parables. Amen. Got it? Because Jesus spoke about a kingdom that was for now, but yet a kingdom to come. That's a parable in itself. And no one could really understand that, but Jesus told some of his disciples, the kingdom of God is within you. That's why you can discern parables is because it's not a thing out there. It's a thing in here. And if you know Jesus, in fact, some of his disciples said, well, Lord, show us the Father. He said, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm the spitting image of the Father. There's not a kingdom out there. There's a kingdom in here. And so what we need to learn when we read these parables of Jesus, he's talking to people who are of the kingdom. And he's sharing insights with us about kingdom principles and kingdom priorities. So that's the big difference. A lot of church people don't really get it. Church people that are not really kingdom people don't really understand. They just kind of know a little bit about the word of God. But the truth is when you understand the word of God, you understand that there is a kingdom that you are a part of that's out of this world. Can I get an amen? Now, people don't understand the parables. There is a, a lot of very wrong thinking about a lot of Jesus' parables and a very high degree of improper preaching even about the parables. Why? Again, because I say there are people who are just church people who try to teach and preach the parables, but they really don't understand. You can't really understand unless the kingdom is within you. And when you have the kingdom within you, you can understand because the parables play a crucial role in the rejection of Jesus Christ. When, when he started speaking parables is when they officially began to reject him as the son of God. So right up to the very final week of his life, the parables of Jesus are about 40 stories, and they are only in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There aren't any parables in the book of John. So this is a turning point in the entire ministry of Jesus on this one day. 
this one day when he began to speak this first parable, he changed from preaching from the gospel or, or preaching from the Old Testament to speaking now in stories and parables. How many of you are glad that he spoke in parables? I love the stories of Jesus. I love how he can, we can relate to him when he speaks about something. Now, again, you have to remember those stories were written for people in the Middle East so that they could understand things that we don't have really a whole lot of sheep farmers over here. Amen. Right? And women don't wear stuff on their head over here like they do there. So you have to understand, you, you, you hear the story, but you understand it's, it's also a, there's a cultural difference when, it, when you read them, right? Because there's a lot of differences in their culture and ours. But the truths are very much universal. The truths can be translated into any culture, any generation. Isn't it amazing how great of a teacher Jesus is that 2,000 years later we still can read and understand what he said? That he relates to not just that generation, but to generations later. He still is relative. We can still understand. But it's not something we understand with our head. It's not head knowledge. It's something we understand with our heart and with our spirit. Can I get an amen? amen? Because when you realize what Jesus is speaking, it doesn't just energize your faith. It energizes your spirit as well. It encourages your spirit, man, to be able to continue to walk in the spirit. Because once you start realizing these truths, you begin to realize that these are mysteries that are unlocked just for you because you're a part of the kingdom of God. That he said these, that not everybody understands this. In fact, it's not even for everybody. It's for those who are in the kingdom. It's amazing. It gives you an understanding how precious you are in the eyes of God that he chose you to be able to receive his word. That you are able to understand the things that he's teaching. An example, Matthew 13, 1 through 2. Everybody say, that day. that day. This was the day that it turned for him. That day, Jesus went out of the house, sitting by the lake of Galilee. And again, large crowds followed him as they always gathered to hear him. So he got into a boat and he sat down and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. Now, this is a captive audience. Jesus has an opportunity here. What does he do? He, he, he did this because it allowed him to move back from the crowd and make his voice heard off the water of the lake. How many of you know Jesus knows every? He knows that he didn't need a sound system. He, he created a sound system. Amen. He doesn't need a way to draw the crowd. He, he is the one who draws the crowd. And he allowed this situation to be set up because he had something he wanted to say. So in verse 3, Jesus spoke many things to them in parables. On this day, everybody say this day. On this day, and from this day on, whenever he taught in public, he spoke only in parables. Because why? Because when you've already exhausted yourself trying to let somebody hear the truth and they reject the truth, you've got to find somebody who wants the truth. Amen. The Bible says there's such a thing as casting your pearls before the swine. And in fact, Jesus said to his own disciples as he sent them out two by two, he said, go all and preach the gospel and cast out devils and heal the sick. And he said, when you come to a house, if they welcome you, praise God, enter into that house and do what, allow them to bless you. But if they don't let you enter their house, shake the dust off your feet and walk away. And that's not something we're all good at, but the reality is what we have is so precious and so wonderful, we cannot allow it to be cast before swine. Amen. Jesus knew that what he gave those, he knew the report they were going to give before they came back. And he knows the report that you're going to give someday when you stand before him face to face and give an account for your life. He knows that report. He knew they would come back and be joyful and celebrate because the devils were subject to them. They won people to Christ. They cast out devils and they healed the sick. And Jesus said, that's wonderful, boys. But he said, there's something even greater. Don't rejoice only in that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Whew. You know what he was saying? He was saying, that's all great and good, but there's something more unique about you than you even realize. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. Amen. That's just what kingdom citizens do. Now, that's why we marvel sometimes when somebody gets healed. Or, and that's good. It's good to be excited. But Jesus would say, that's what I do. Why do you get so excited about that? 
Why? I, he's told me that personally. I, I, there were some things happening. I said, God, you're so good to show me. He said, yeah, but why are you so excited? I said, because that's awesome. He goes, yeah, but that's what I do. <laughs> I was like, oh. In other words, we need to come to expect kingdom results from kingdom people. He's teaching kingdom parables to only those who have ears to hear what he's saying. Not everybody has ears to hear what Jesus is saying. And they don't have ears to hear what you're saying. But the truth is, you could say to them, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. And who you are, you are a representative of his kingdom. He gives you the privilege to be an ambassador. What you speak is grounded and backed by the word of God. It's truth that cannot be repelled. It's the one truth that stands the test of time. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And Jesus spoke in this manner so that he would identify those who belong to him. So I know you're all asking, what is a parable? Thank you for asking because I wanted to tell you. It's a word picture. He's, he talks about sheep. So what do you see in your mind? Fluffy white animals. But what you don't see is a lamb chop. Right? I'm starting to think about the lamb chop. Forget the white fluffy thing. Let's eat the thing. It's a word picture. He talks about a boat or he talks about a farmer sowing seed. So you see a guy throwing seed and you see a field and you see this. So he, he wants you to think beyond just words and see it. It's an elongated or simple metaphor. It's a way to be able to teach you something that will, will be able to give you a collective sense of understanding. A parable can be relatively short or it can be a long one. The fact is, it doesn't matter the length. The fact is, is how he speaks it. The word para means to lay alongside. So it's a story laid alongside of a truth to show their parallel realities. So while he's talking about a farmer, he's really talking about the principle of sowing and reaping. And, and he's talking about a, a, a truth that parallels any generation, any Anyone educated or uneducated, as long as you're in the kingdom, that parallel will be able to be understood because you can understand the parables of Jesus. It's a parallel truth. So when, when the world says he's talking about a farmer, you're like, no, he's not. He's talking about me. And when he's talking about the world says, no, he's talking about somebody who's a fisherman. No, he's not. He's talking about me. When somebody that sold that field, and, and he, just because he wanted to buy the pearl in the field, he's, he's talking about somebody that wants to buy land. No, he's not. He's talking about somebody that loves God so much and his kingdom so much, he'll give everything he has for the kingdom of God. Why do I know that? Because I understand the parables. Because I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I'm privileged to have that information. That's part of my inheritance as a child of God to be able to understand the parables of Jesus. Because why? Because I, understand, I think kingdom, I speak kingdom, and I, and I comprehend kingdom. Now, we might remember filling out, uh, finding out about a parabola, which, in, you know, that's two curved lines. They always mirror each other perfectly, but they never intersect. They're always just staying par parallel to each other. And so that's the parable. Jesus began that day to speak only in parables, and that was a monumental change in his ministry. Now he no longer directed his message to the world. He was directing his message to his disciples. And I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus is today directing his message to his disciples. And he's speaking to the church. It's time for the church to get ready for the coming of the Son of Man. He's speaking clearly to the body of Christ in the signs and all the times around us. He's showing us in all these events that it's time for us to get ready and to get those who are willing to get in the boat, to get in the boat before it's too late, to get on board with God, to be saved, to be redeemed, because the time is coming when the door will shut and nobody else will be able to enter in. Now, up to this time, Jesus had basically uh, drawn from the Old Testament, and he gave teachings based on Old Testament scripture. Why? Because that's what those people understood. Religious leaders, if you got to the level of a Pharisee, now Paul was a Pharisee. 
And he, and he was a very educated man. If you got to the level where you were a Pharisee, a teacher of the law in Israel, you could memorize the first five books of the Bible. Word for word. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. You knew every word and you, and you could say it. So they knew exactly what Jesus was teaching. He spent the first part of his ministry trying to help them understand. Now, aren't you grateful that some did? We know that some did because, you know, one of the guys uh, was able to get a tomb for him and all of this because why? He understood. He allowed the teaching to impact his heart. But most of them rejected him because, again, Jesus based it on what they knew. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the law. They studied it and they memorized it. And so he taught them on that and they still didn't believe him. So then he shifted his focus, and now he says, look, I'm going to teach people that want to hear. I'm going to give this gospel to those who will receive it willingly. You rejected it. And that's what Jesus said we, in the New Testament teaching. We as Gentiles have been engrafted into the vine. Amen. So where God has a chosen people, the Jewish people, that he gave his promise to, and he said, you will be my chosen people, they rejected him. So in order to make them jealous, God gave the gospel to us Gentiles. Somebody say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I thank my Jewish brothers and sisters for rejecting Jesus. Because now we have hope of the gospel. Isn't it amazing? The very truth, the very God, the very love, the very salvation that they should have is given to us. And it really wasn't intended that way, but that's how it is. And so God came and he preached on the earth to the people. He's given them another chance. He's given them an opportunity. Look, I'm here. I'm the son of God. I'm doing the miracle. Jesus said, if you don't believe me, just believe on what I'm doing. Just watch. I'm, look, I raised a guy from de death to life. Is that not enough for you? I thank God. Again, for some, for a few of the religious leaders, the Bible says that the resurrection of Lazarus, some of them believed. But not everybody and not many believed. It took more. But Jesus had to come to a point to say, look, there are other people out there who will gladly receive this gospel. And they don't know the five books of the Old Testament. i got to teach them in a way that they can understand it. And I'm so grateful that he did because I'm a child of God. My name is written in heaven. I'm so grateful he gave me an opportunity to receive this gospel that I didn't have to be a Jew to enter in because I wasn't born a Jew, but I am a Jew now. I wasn't born a child of God, but I'm a child of God now. I wasn't born in the lineage, but now I'm in the lineage, and my name is in heaven, and I got a place in this kingdom. Hallelujah! Why? Because Jesus said it's time for other people to receive the gospel that want the gospel. You don't have to take it. You don't have to choose it. You don't have to accept it. But I guarantee you, he's going to present it to you. Now, this all gets started on a Sabbath day, of course. Wouldn't Jesus pick the day that they are supposed to honor him? God's law for the Sabbath is this, don't work. Now, trying to tell a Jewish person not to work is like telling him to beat himself on the head with a sledgehammer. Nothing more to it. A day of what? That's it. That's pretty easy. That's pretty simple. I just want you to rest. I don't want you to work. I don't want you to toil. I want you to rest. Now, if you don't think you need to do that, you must be bigger than God. Because he made the earth in six days. And everything you see. But on the seventh day, he rested. rested. So you ought to rest. Because you didn't do nothing like he did. You can't even think that much. So he says to rest. Now, they rejected everything else about God. They also rejected the Sabbath. They, 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 they made it so much their thing. Watch. Somebody says, I'm a Sabbatarian. What does that mean? That's like a vegetarian, right? And, a, and a, all these other vegetarians. A Sabbatarian says, I don't do that on Sunday. I don't go there. I can't do this and I can't do that because I'm a Sabbatarian. I, it's, my, it's my day. But that's not according to the law of God. God's law only said rest and don't work. Take the day off. That's the Sabbath according to the word of God. It was intended, according to Isaiah 58, 13, to be a day of delight and a day of rest. 
and a day of worship. Amen? Amen. Now, I give people a little slack because this is a long weekend. And some decided to go to the lake instead of worship. Amen. But you're here, and I'm grateful that you're here this morning. But what I'm saying is, how many of us in America today could give God at least a couple of hours on a Sunday morning knowing what he's given to you. It's just amazing to think that so many people don't honor God and come to his house on a day of worship to worship God. I really don't really preach that long. A lot of times. Sometimes. But my point is, even if I did, it's the point of coming to, it's not about me or you, it's about coming to worship him. It's about coming to honor God and to give thanks to the God who has given you blessings all week long. That for six days he has watched over you. Six days he's provided for you. Six days he's been your shelter and your shield and your Messiah. For six days he's been your God, your friend, your father. And you don't have time for two hours to give him back on Sunday to say thank you. That's not even a parable. So we all understand the foolishness of the history of Israel. They began this foolishness. After they were given the law of God, they virtually disobeyed it for centuries. Consequently, they ran opposite of the Sabbath. They didn't rest. They didn't delight in God. They didn't use it as a day of worship. They broke the Sabbath day and the Sabbath year. They broke the Sabbath all the time. Why? They did it for money, for apostasy, idolatry, apathy, and indifference. They violated the Sabbath. They weren't honoring God on that day. Eventually, the rabbis started becoming concerned about the violations of the Sabbath, so they wanted to protect the Sabbath. In order to sort of kind of recover the Sabbath and insulate the Sabbath against such violations, they covered the Sabbath with endless rules they made up. They weren't in the Bible. They just made them up. Now, how much of that's happening today when you go to a particular church that they have this idea and this rule? I remember when I was first as a pastor starting to baptize folks, and in this particular area of the country where our church was, they would say, well, when you baptize me, pastor, what are you going to say? And I was like, I don't know, abracadabra? Hocus pocus? But they had a thing. Some people said, you can't. I can't be baptized unless you baptize me in Jesus' name only. And I was like, okay, well, let's just do it in Jesus' name only then. What does it matter? The point is, it's not about what I say. The point is, what are you doing in that tank? Amen. What got you in that tank? It's not about something somebody said. It's a love for Jesus. You realize you need the grace of God. You need the love of the Father. You were going in the wrong direction, and he pulled you out of darkness and put you in the light. He picked you up out of the miry clay, and he put you on a rock. That's why you're in the water, and not what I say. You won't remember what I said anyway, but what you will remember is when you went under that water, all your sins are washed away symbolically. When you come out of that water, you're a brand new creation in Christ. And hallelujah, and you're different. You're different. That's where it's not about the formality. It's not about what I say. It's not about how we do it. It's not if we sprinkle you on the head. It's not if we dunk you under or how long we hold you under. There are times the Lord says, hold him down a little more. I'm like, but God, he's like, I'll, I'll, I'll bring him back to life if you kill him. Just hold him down. It takes a while to forgive his sins. <laughs> now, that's not biblical. Don't be thinking I'm saying that. That was a parable. <laughs> Even I speak in parables. <laughs> they couldn't just leave it to the simplicity of worshiping God. You see, that's the worst thing that, that can happen to us is God makes it simple for us. Now, it was funny if someone shared a testimony with me this morning after our freedom class. They said, you know, this little person was... Uh, really stressed out, and, 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 and she said, well, look, you don't have to be worried about that. God, God can carry you. You don't have to carry that burden. He can do it. He takes your burden. He, he can lift that off your, sh and the little girl said, well, he's already got a whole lot of other stuff to do. I don't know. If, you know and that's kind of how we think, like, he, he, look, he made the earth in six days, folks. He created everything. He can handle it. He can do it. And he wants us just to do a simple thing is worship him, but we want to make it complex. 
Oh, wait, should we raise our hands or not? Wait, should we sing off the wall or should we sing out of a book? Wait, should we, oh, should we even sing? Oh, wait, wait, wait. We shouldn't have instruments. And you know, see what I'm saying? God just says, hey, just worship me. What if you don't have any instruments? Your real instrument is your voice to praise the Lord. The greatest instrument you have is your voice to say, I love you, Father. I worship you, God. You're my king. You're my savior. That's worship, not how fast we sing or slow we sing or what we sing. The devil trips you up on that. I've been in churches where they got two sections and the people in that section don't ever sit in that section. And when you tell them to shake hands, they don't go over there. Because those the McCoys are over there and the Hatfields are over here. <laughs> and you ask them, well, why don't you go over there? I say, I don't know. They, we just don't go over there. We make it so complicated. We, 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 somehow, so you're talking with somebody at work. Oh, I was church. Oh, it was great. They, we, we sang all fast songs. So I'm charged up today. Oh, we only sang hymns at my church. Well, why do we have to make it about us? Why can't we make it about him? Why can't we just say we came together and, man, we worshiped God and the presence of the Lord was in our house and God's presence came and touched our lives? Man, I'm so glad I went to church and worshiped God. And, and the Jews just couldn't make it that simple. They, they had to... In, and for all these laws upon people and all these, and they would catch people doing things on the Sabbath they shouldn't do and, and oppress them because it was about them. It was about the laws they created. So you got to know Jesus was about to attack that. So by Jesus' time, the Sabbath is now the most dreaded day of the week. Every way you could look at it, it was miserable. It's not a day off. It's a day of all kinds of ridiculous encumbrances and burdens. The pendulum had swung from complete abandonment of the Sabbath to the establishment of a religious, legalistic system. And I got news for you, it's still here today. Churches all over this great country are religious establishments, doing the same thing week in and week out with no real honor to God, no real devotion to the Lord, just simply the routine and the ritual and the religion, and it's dead. It's not kingdom. If you taught a parable in that church, they wouldn't understand it. Because they're not in the kingdom. In the kingdom, you understand the king. He imparts the truth. Jesus loved the Sabbath. Why? Because he created it. And that became another way that he attacked their self-righteous legalistic system. Watch what Jesus does, and he does it in a story. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus on the Sabbath day walking through the grain fields. He shouldn't have been walking anywhere at all. He already violated the Sabbath. He's supposed to be at home on the couch. And his disciples shouldn't be walking, and then he's picking grain, and they shouldn't be doing that because that's harvesting, and they shouldn't be consuming it. They were breaking every law you can imagine. And the Pharisees in verse 2 say, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now here, you're trying to tell the Lord of the Sabbath what he's supposed to be doing on the Sabbath. That's stupid in the first place. It's, it's, it's always backwards, isn't it? It's backwards if you don't get it. If you don't understand it, you, you'd be talking to the very source of truth about truth. And so he says, hey, they're not doing right. It's, but it's not by the Old Testament law, not by any divine prescription, purely and simply because it was violating the traditions that they had developed to replace the law. Now that's what's happening so much today in our world is that we have replaced God's word with our own laws. What we do, what we don't do, is that according to the word or is that according to your denomination or your religion or your church or what you do? You have to ask those questions. Jesus responds by telling them about an instance in the Old Testament. Why did he do that? That's what they understood. Let me tell you something familiar. He said, when David's men ate the bread out of the temple to show how ridiculous. See, when David was, was being pursued by Saul and he was running like a, you know, a vagabond in the desert, he didn't have much to survive on. And he went to the temple one day and he needed some food. 
And the priest was like, man, that's the showbread. That, we, that's, that's for the Lord. And David's like, yeah, I think he would understand. I think he would allow me to eat that bread in this circumstance because it's not so much about the bread. or the, It's about the reality of I'm his child. And he gave David the bread, and he gave him Goliath's sword, as you know. But the point is, David did that, and, and, G, and Jesus shows him that same example to show how ridiculous their Sabbath rules had become. He's going to show us today how foolish our religion is because it's man-made stuff. Religion is all about man. Worship is all about God. Amen. Hunger was a greater priority than some man-made rule. And there are a lot of things that are more important than rules man makes up. And so I want to encourage us as we study the parables and look at what Jesus taught. He taught that for a very important reason because he wanted to teach the kind of people who would hear him, not only hear him, because the Bible says his sheep know his voice and they follow him because of his voice so if you're hearing his voice you're going to understand the parables because you're one of his sheep now then you add into it verse 8 when Jesus says something that just distresses them to the max don't tell me what to do on the Sabbath the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath I'll do what I want to do on the Sabbath because I am the Lord of the Sabbath isn't that amazing? That, but that's how foolish religion is. It tells God what he can and can't do in his own house. Well, you can't do that. You, somebody can't speak in tongues in your house. They can't prophesy in here. They can't say, well, why not? It's his house. And he says that can happen. But some folks have rules. Some folks have things that, well, we shouldn't do that in here. But you have to ask yourself, is that God's rule or is that your rule? Because if you're abiding by those rules in here, you're doing a whole lot more out there, too. Now, from there, Jesus went into a synagogue where there was a man with a withered hand. This is incredible, right? The question, they questioned Jesus saying, hey, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, of course, in their system, it wasn't. So they wanted to say that. Why? Only to accuse him. So Jesus says, what man is there among you who has a sheep and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath will not take hold of it and lift it out? Will you not take hold of it and lift it out? Well, how much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So Jesus forgot them, forget you. He looks at the man and he says to the man, stretch out your hand. And in verse 14, the Pharisees went out and conspired against him. Why would somebody being healed make them angry? That's when you know it's religion. When God does miracles in his house and some folks get mad about it. That's a spirit of religion. And it might as well be witchcraft. Because it's an anti-Christ spirit. If you can't celebrate with God when he heals somebody, when he delivers somebody, when he saves somebody, when he sets somebody free. Maybe it didn't happen in the way you thought it should or how you thought it should, but that's really not up to you. That's up to him. And you need to allow God to be God in your life, no matter what rules you have made up, what ideas we have thought up. You need to let God be God because God can change anything at any time, anyhow. Why? Because he is God. You're not. He gets to do what he wants to do, and we're going to celebrate and rejoice no matter what. Amen. So now they're going to destroy him. Why? Because now he's speaking in parables. They want to kill him for violating their stupid rules, their ridiculous Sabbath rules that they made up. And so, yes, this was symbolic of Jesus' assault. This is why now he's coming under attack, uh, and, and now he's beginning to to launch at them when he starts calling them vipers and, and he starts telling them that they're whitewashed tombs, that on the outside they look great, but on the inside they're dead man's bones. Why? Because they can't hear him anymore. They can't hear the truth. They can't hear the parables. They're not going to understand the way to eternal life. So Jesus now has to treat them as they are. And that's hard. But on the same day in verse 22, a demon-possessed man is blind and mute and brought to Jesus. So he healed him, as what would you think Jesus would do? And the people were saying, this man can't be the son of David. How can he be? Is this the Messiah? 
I would think the answer would probably be yes. Now, when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man cast out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Now, and then Jesus tells them how stupid that is. How can a person who's demon-possessed cast out demons? <laughs> That's religion. That's what he's saying. That's how foolish our religion is. Now listen, I grew up religious. I went to a religious church. I went to a place of where we were very religious. I learned that. And it's hard to get that out of your blood. Very difficult to get that venom out of your blood. And Jesus knew that. So two years into his ministry, and the final conclusion of the Pharisees is, he does what he does by the power. That, I mean, that's the conclusion they come to. That everything he does is from hell? So Jesus is inspired by Satan, really, was their conclusion. So if that's your conclusion after a full revelation of the Son of God, you're hopeless. And that's what Jesus declared. You can't see this. You can't see the kingdom. You can never own the kingdom until you first see the kingdom. You have to see it. And then when you see it, that's why, that's why when... John the Baptist was doing what he always did, baptizing people and getting people to repent and turn to God, that one day he looked up and he said, hey, there he is. That's the Lamb of God. That's the man who takes away the sins of the world right there, and that's Jesus. It didn't take him no time to identify him. He knew right who that was. And he said, look, my job's over now. All I was trying to do was get it ready for him. Now he's come on the scene. I'm done. Why? Because he's a kingdom guy. He understands the kingdom. He's the forerunner of Christ. He's the proclaimer of the Messiah. And now the Messiah is here. Hey, hey! I, 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 now it's his turn. Now he's going to take over. And that's exactly what John understood. And the Pharisees hated John just as much as they hated Jesus. Verse 3 says, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. When someone blasphemes the Holy Spirit by saying that which he does is done through the Son of Man or, or through the Son of God is from hell, that person is beyond the point of salvation. When they can look at what Jesus does and say that comes from hell. Now, I understand people are ignorant, they don't fully understand, or they're going by what they heard. I, when I first received the, the Pentecostal experience of baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, shared with some of my friends and people, and, Rome, and a lot of them said that, that's from the devil. And I was like, man, I, I didn't ask the devil for that. He wasn't anywhere near me when I, man, I was so full. I was dancing and singing and shouting. The devil wasn't in that church when I got the Holy Ghost. Man, I didn't, I, all I felt was Jesus. All I felt was a well of life bubbling up inside of me. It came from my stomach and all the way up my, my body, all the way. And it just came spilling out of my mouth until I was speaking a language. I didn't know what it was. You can't tell me the devil was anywhere near me. I think the devil was somewhere in Cincinnati bowing down, afraid that I would come get him. But that sure as blankety-blank wasn't from hell. And again, I don't condemn them. I know that's something they've been taught. Because what man does is he justifies why he can't follow God. Because it's from the devil. That's what, it's an old trick. The Pharisees did it. They still do it today. Just because you don't want to do it, just because you don't believe it, because you don't want to walk with God, just because you don't want to press in, you don't want to pursue God, you don't want to sacrifice, you don't want to give your life to Him, you don't want to serve Him, out, then you've got to make up rules so that every, now you can be justified. Yeah. And that's exactly why those people will say to the Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out devils? Didn't we heal the sick? Yeah, yeah, but I don't know who you are. Your name's not on the books up here. You're not on the roll. You did that for you. You didn't do that for me. You did it your way. You were the Frank Sinatra church. You did it your way. I don't know who you are. The difference is you weren't in the kingdom. You were a church person, but not a kingdom person. Church people do a lot of stuff. And I, hey, man, I'm grateful for some of them, man. They, they, they work hard, but, but their labor is in vain. Because they, they that labor in vain, those who build their own church, those, they labor in vain. But those who build God's house, they labor for the glory of God. There's a big difference there who you're laboring for. 
Because I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people that work hard in churches, but they're church people and they don't know God. They're like the Jews. They're like the Pharisees who memorize all the Bible. They do all the rituals. They walk around praying for people. They do all the, but they're not saved. They're as lost as the man on the moon, but they look the part. In fact, Jesus told them, man, that, that's the only thing you got going for. You got really cool looking robes. That's what he said. You walk around with your robes and you got tassels on them, but you only do that to be seen by men. And you pray these loud and exorbitant prayers in King James that nobody understands, and they may think you're holy because you pray this wonderful prayer. But he said, that's nothing. He said, why, why disciples? They go into their closet and they pray. They don't let anybody know that they're praying because they want to go to their father and pray in secret so that when they pray, that God hears their prayers. But you're just walking around like a bag of air and wasting a lot of valuable oxygen. And that's what sadly a lot of people are doing is today is wasting a lot of breath and wasting a lot of time and energy on man-made religion. If anyone speaks a word against the Son of Man, eh, you could speak a word against him. His humanness or his life, that could be forgiven. They spoke a lot of mean things about Jesus. They cursed him. They pulled it on his beard. They spat in his face. That can be forgiven if they repent. But if your conclusion is that what the Holy Spirit has done through him is from hell, then you can't be forgiven. If you credit the goodness of God to the devil, there's a problem, a big problem. That's not a quick fix. Divine condemnation is found in verse 37 when he says this, by your words. Wow. By your words, you will be justified. On the other hand, by your words, you will be condemned. Let me help you. You better know what you're speaking lines up with the word of God. They have to be in agreement. They have to coexist. They have to coincide. Because what all the things the Pharisees were saying didn't line up with the will of God or the word of God. But everything Jesus said, what did he say? I only say what my Father says. If Jesus had to do that, how much more do we have to do that? He didn't just blab things on his own. He didn't come up with stuff. He just said what the Father said. So when his disciples said, hey, Jesus, show us the Father, he said, hey, wait a minute, you're looking at him. Yeah. Tell us what he's, no, listen to me, and you're hearing the Father. But the day wasn't even over at this point. When we picked up the story in Mark, at this particular point, after this incredible conflict around the synagogue, Jesus gets into a boat. And now he's with his disciples, and he goes across the north shore of the Sea of Galilee over to the eastern side. And when he brings them to the shore, a maniac comes running out of the caves, naked and demonized as a legion of demons. Jesus confronts him, and he sends the demons into a herd of pigs. They dive into the Sea of Galilee, an incredible day. But this is one day. All this is in one day. One day of massive expression of divine power and an epic conclusion of God because it was a week from now that Jesus would go to the cross. So the Pharisees' verdict is in. Jesus does what he does by the power of hell. That was their message. It, is, it has to be hell because only hell would attack our righteousness and our religion. And look, entire denominations don't exist anymore. Today, there are wonderful churches. doesn't matter if they're, you know, they're, they're denominational or not. In all walks, there, there are kingdom churches in every aspect. Don't get me wrong. In every aspect. In Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, all of them. Catholic, there are God-fearing, born-again Catholics. I got it. But I'm going to tell you that in, as a whole, you wouldn't think that the Methodist church, when you see today, are the ones who brought the fire of Pentecost to the body of Christ. But they were the tongue-talking, devil-casting-out, fire-breathing church when they were established with the Wesleys. But over time, like anything else, it cools off. And the enemy creeps in in little ways here and there. 
And he begins to bring religion to us. It's just, it always goes back to the Exodus where God's people come out of bondage and they don't really understand freedom because they haven't been free for over 400 years. But they're literally free in the wilderness to praise God, to choose God, to worship God, but they allow their circumstances to dictate their worship. Now it's hot and we need water and we can't worship God if we're thirsty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we start questioning, why did you bring us out here? To kill us? It's the same principle that keeps repeating itself. So that once we get the fire of God, once we get, we get everything God wants, we, it cools off, the enemy comes, creeps in with little tidbits here and there to bring us to a place of religion to where now, if we accept that, we become frozen in our faith. And look, I, I want to say a couple of things that I feel I need to say. Because when we come to an age where we can't cast out devils, we got a problem. We come to a place where we can't raise the dead. See, Jesus, what did he say to his own disciples when the man brought the guy to him? He brought the demon-possessed man. He said, hey, look, my son, he, he's full of demons, and when they attack him, they try to drown him or they try to burn him in a fire. And I need these devils gone, and, and they, they brought him to the disciples. And they did whatever they could do, but they couldn't cast him out. Now, Jesus didn't go, hey, good job, guys. Way to go for the team. No. He rebuked them. He said, what, what's the deal, fellas? What, what's wrong with what's, what? Why do you have such little faith? Bring him to me. You still haven't got it yet? Bring him to me. And with just a word, Jesus cast the devil out of the boy. And that's what he expects. And so when we come to a place, somehow religion has caught into our minds that we are factoring in other things other than God wants to heal the sick and raise the dead and save the sinner and purge his church and bring revival. Well, that's what we ought to be believing every moment of our lives. And it's only religion and self and the enemy that creeps in to cause doubt and fear and wonder until every church then will just decide to sit there and sing the songs we sing and do the things we do regardless of what Jesus does. Now, I just want you all to hear that so you can tell somebody outside this church. <laughs> right? All right, look, there's only a little bit more. Don't look at me like that, okay? Gee whiz. I'm going to get you out of here. <laughs> right. I promise. Uh, landing gear is out. Mark 4.33, with many parables, Jesus was speaking the word to them as far as they were able. Look, as far as they were able to hear. Remember what he said to them? There's a lot more I have to tell you guys, but you can't accept it right now. So he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. Why does he only speak in parables? Why the change? Why does Jesus now give illustrations and stories? Well, in Matthew 13, 10, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And that's the question. Why are you doing this, Lord? Listen to Jesus' answer. To you, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because you're educated? No. Why? Because you're smart? No. Why? Because you're good looking? Way no. It's because you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. But to them, it has not been granted by their own choice, not, their, not my choice, but by their choice to reject the kingdom. They can't hear me. I speak in parables so they cannot understand. That has not been given to them to understand. Now, if I continue speaking clear truth, they will understand. But if I speak to them in parables, they won't. So what Jesus does all the time is he speaks in parables because that's kingdom truth. And the people of the kingdom are recognized because they understand kingdom truth. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. That, that being that loud, I'm only going to do one more slide. Matthew 13, 11 through 17. In them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never... Look, you can see the devil's cast out of somebody, but you're like, oh, 
Okay. That's for them. But that was really for you. You can see it, but you won't perceive it. For this people's heart has grown callous. Now, that's not going to happen at White Dove. That's just not going to happen. They hardly hear. Now, these weren't old people. It wasn't just because they're, they were older. It says they hardly hear with their, it's a choice. They have selective hearing. And they have closed their eyes. Again, that's their choice. That's their choice. Jesus is telling them, look, guys, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm doing here. I'm not hating these people. I'm not mistreating them. I'm not rejecting them. They rejected me. And because they rejected me, they can't see me and they can't hear me. When Look, remember, on the ground, looking up to heaven as they pound the nails in him? Jesus is like, hey, God, you got to forgive them. They, they don't get it. They don't understand. They're, they're just, they, they, they're doing what they were told. Their, their, their religion makes them believe that I am a lawbreaker and I got to pay. But we know, what, we know what we're doing here, but they don't know what we're doing. And there will be a lot of instances in your life where you know what you're doing, but those around you don't have any idea what you're doing. And you have to be okay with that. All right? All right, stand with me this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Look, I'm going to tell you this morning that the way to understand the parables of Jesus is to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. And to be a citizen of the kingdom of God doesn't mean you go to a church. It means you're born again. And to be born again means that you have not only understood that Jesus died on a cross for your sins and has shed his blood for your transgressions, but that you testify that you love Christ with all your heart. You invite him into your life as your Savior. You believe God raised him from the dead. And you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. The Bible says you shall be saved. Hallelujah. And that being mostly saved from yourself, but saved from condemnation and sin and guilt and punishment and saved to eternal life in the kingdom of God to become a citizen of the kingdom of God. That's what's so important. And a lot of people don't understand that. They're just church going folks, good people, but they don't realize the big difference. And the big difference is the difference between life and death. So, I want you to know this morning that God loves you so much that he made that possible for you. The thing is, you have to see it. I can't make you see it. I wish I could. Boy, if I could do that, I'd be filling stadiums to make people see God loves them, God cares for them. He made a plan just for you to come to him and have eternal life. But I can tell you, and if you can, if you can receive that this morning, you can be a citizen of the kingdom of God. And you can escape the darkness and the condemnation and the judgment, and you can have life eternal beginning now and extending forever and ever. Hallelujah. It's up to you. You have to choose that you hear him, that you see him, and if you do, you can receive him and you can respond to him. Amen. So I'm going to pray this prayer. I want you to pray with me. All of us can pray it. But if there's anyone here today that say, Pastor, I've been coming to church, but I have not yet become a citizen of the kingdom of God. And I want to make that step today. I'm tired of religion. I want a relationship. Because that's where it's at, friend. It's in that relationship with Jesus. That day to day, you know he's with you. You know he's your friend. You know he's your father. You know he loves you. You know he cares for you. And you know you can lean on him. So pray this out loud. Let's pray this together. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for sending Jesus to die on a cross for my sins. I ask you to forgive me for all my sins. I'm sorry, Lord that I've hurt you. But I repent today and I ask you, Jesus, to come live in my heart. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. I believe you rose from the dead and I call you Lord. 
Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on, let's celebrate with the angels. Hallelujah.